Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the witching hour. Uh, we are digesting our lunch and we need to wake up. So good afternoon in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. It is particular pleasure for me to be a part of an event sponsored by the Heritage Foundation where I spent 20 plus wonderful years. And of course, I want to thank uh, Sandy Saunders, my good friend, and the Saunders Legal Foundation, uh, Saunders Foundation for the Rule of Law. I got it. Um, and uh, I also want to thank Joel, and Joel, with whom I had a pleasure work, working together at the Heritage Foundation uh, for being here. Wow, this is a particularly special place in time for me. We were in the Knesset today. In 83, 84, I was a, an advisor to a uh, Knesset member working on many things I work today. Russia, well, it was called the Soviet Union, remember? Uh, human rights, uh, Israeli security. Uh, my family comes from the occupied territories. No, it's not what you think. It's a Crimea now occupied by Russia, and at the time it was the Soviet Union, and my family was a refusenik family. We could not leave Russia for three and a half years, and because of Americans, the British, the Dutch, and other people, Christians and Jews, who helped us to get out of that horrible place called the Soviet Union, I'm here today. Israel is a very special place for me. I lived here for 11 years after we got out of the Soviet Union. My grandmother and my mother are buried in this land. My kids, who were born in the United States, volunteered to serve in Tzahal, like Joel's kids. Uh, they're soldiers in infantry. Uh, my son was in recon, and my daughter was an infantry instructor. She taught uh, boys and girls how to shoot machine guns. So you can imagine that this is a special land, this is a special occasion. But Joel is absolutely right. We are in a battle for our survival as a Judeo-Christian civilization, and Israel, ladies and gentlemen, is a battlefield state. It's a frontline state in this battle. And this battle is centuries old, and the vanguard, of course, is the radical Islam, both of the Shia variety and of the Sunni variety. The Shia variety is closer to uh, having nuclear weapons, but the Sunni variety of radical Islam made numerous attempts to get weapons of mass destruction, to use chemical weapons, to experiment with biological weapons, and now increasingly the battleground is in cyberspace. It's not just the Sunnis and the Shias. It's also the Russians and the Chinese who are making great advances in cyberspace. With cyber, you can bring American energy infrastructure, electric, internet that runs everything down. The Chinese reached into tens of millions of records of our civil servants. Through cyber, you can bring airplanes down, you can do great things with cyber, but we're talking about the threats. And by the way, you heard Israel is in the forefront of doing cyber security. Now, the Islamist threat is here in Syria, where um, ISIS, or Daesh as they call it here, uh, that's an Arabic uh, abbreviation for ISIS, have created a space for themselves in Syria and in Iraq. Why in Iraq? Because the Obama administration left Iraq without signing the Status of Forces Agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, I taught at the Georgetown, I taught at Loyola Marymount. If I had an undergraduate student who wrote a paper and said you can leave a country after war that you occupied without a status of forces agreement, I would have given that student an F for effort. 
didn't we learn anything after World War II when Truman, a Democrat president, uh, left uh, or, or created a post-war foundations in Germany and Japan that are still the groundwork for the success, most successful economies and alliances we had after World War II. Uh, if we're leaving Afghanistan with only 5,500 soldiers, as President Obama said, the Russians already made a move and said they are going to create the Central Asia uh, front. And the Obama administration sent Secretary Kerry to Central Asia this week to try to calm down the five states of Central Asia. There's also a challenge of China. China and Russia together are working closely. They are in a pragmatic alliance, and so is Iran and Russia, are in a pragmatic alliance. They use each other to pursue their own interest. Iran is projecting power west through the Shia area of Iraq into Syria, which is Alawi close to Shia, and Hezbollah. The leader of Hezbollah, Sheikh Nasrallah, is called officially the representative of the Rahbar, the supreme leader of Iran in Lebanon. And Russia is creating a security belt thousand miles away from the Russian border in the Middle East. The Russians were not involved ever in the battleground operations. They sent, sent some pilots, they sent some um, uh, anti-aircraft that was wiped out by Israel in 1982. But this comeback did not exist since before 1982, since 1972, for 40 plus years, when Henry Kissinger negotiated um, a withdrawal, or, or he negotiated uh, with Sadat, kicking out of the Russian advisors from Egypt. They're back. Um, the Russians want the two bases in Latakia for the Air Force and in Tartus for the Navy. They have about 40 airplanes and Spetsna, special forces, that are interacting with the Iranians, the Syrian army, and the Hezbollah to save the Assad regime. Um, the Russians are improving their relationship with the Egyptians and uh, for a country that has an economy of one-tenth of the United States. One-tenth of us, they're trying to be our peer competitor in the Middle East, in Ukraine, in Central and Eastern Europe, and in the Baltic states. From the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, Russia is back. So the reset policy that President Obama declared and at the Heritage Foundation, I wrote five uh, memos on failure of the reset policy. Um, the reset policy, unfortunately, failed. So what are the challenges for us now? Uh, the challenges are having leadership, having strategy, uh, not making climate change and gay rights the only, the top priority of the U.S. foreign policy. I'm not saying that. I'm not making it up. This is congressional staff coming to me and, and asking me a question. Ariel, what are the three top American priorities? I said, Russia, China, Daesh. Russia, China, ISIS. Oh, by the way, and Iran. I said, no, 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 you're wrong. So what do you mean you're wrong? There's only two priorities. It's not four. And it's gay rights and climate change. Okay. Uh, in um, Syria, by forcing our hand and by engaging ISIS, the Russians and Syria and uh, Syrian army and um, the Iranians are trying to get Mr. al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, who make Osama bin Laden look like a scholar and a gentleman. The depravity of uh, ISIS behavior, of inviting people to partake in executions and in rape, in a ritual rape. So, as they say, if 10 
ISIS fighters rape a woman who is not Muslim, she would automatically convert into Islam. Killing kids, uh, trading in women and children for slavery. This is 21st century. And for four years, all we said is that we're going to provide some air power on a minimal basis and just let this go on. We expected our allies, Turkey, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia to be engaged. Qatar is sitting on one trillion dollars natural national reserve uh, national reserve fund. Kuwait seven hundred million dollars. Saudi Arabia hundreds and hundreds of million dollars. What are they doing with that? Are they helping the refugees from Syria? Joel, it's what seven eight million refugees now. A third of the population of Syria are refugees. Are they helping them? No. In the Arab legal system, there is no category of refugee. So all these people do not qualify to get a penny from the Qatari fund that funded the terrorists of Hamas um, to make rockets that rained on the Israeli cities. And when the Europeans are trying to deal with this challenge, we're going to hear from our colleague Mikhail in a moment, they are not even raising the issue of why one category of Sunni Arab countries do not help the Sunni Arab brethren to get shelter in these countries that are importing millions and millions of foreign workers from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from the Philippines, Malaysia, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not happening, and the, our problem is that we're not raising that issue. The Obama administration, to the best of my knowledge, did not go to Qataris, Kuwaitis, and Saudis and said, take these people, these are your people. And uh, I was in Berlin a month ago talking to the senior officials of the German government, and thousands and thousands of people were coming every day to Germany. And I said to a senior official, so please, and this is a classic Washington question, please tell me, what was the interagency process, meaning what are the parts of the government talking to each other, before Frau Merkel made that decision? And he looked at me like I was stupid and said, what interagency inter process? There was none. And my next question was, Klaus, what are the intelligence filters that you set up to filter, to, to screen these migrants to make sure that Al-Qaeda and ISIS do not make their inroads, and for that matter, so don't the Muslim Brotherhood. And he said, I'm very sorry to tell you, Ariel, we have none. We're going to backstop it after these people are in the country and try to weed them out and try to deny them asylum after they already got the asylum in the country, and if you, try, if you think you can do it in a German court, good luck. So what happened? One thing, believe it or not, I thought long and hard about it, the Europeans have to thank Adolf Hitler for that. Because what Hitler did has created such a complex of guilt in the Germans that Frau Merkel decided that it will be a good form for them to show that they're not the same Germans as they were between 1933 and 1945. So they said, okay, come here, we will provide uh, refuge for them. The second issue for me as a lapsed lawyer is shocking because I asked Klaus, the same senior official, do you guys distinguish between economic migrants and refugees from conflict? And he said, de facto, we're not. And he added, this breaks down the rule of law in Europe. So the EU and the Europeans who are lecturing Israel for not being nice to those Palestinians who knife, stab, and murder in the streets in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem, are lecturing the Israelis about how the roadblocks that prevent these murderers from coming in are not nice. And why don't you reduce the number of the roadblocks? And what are you doing for people waiting too long in the roadblock. 
I should tell them about Russian roadblocks in Chechnya, when a person can be drawn, thrown out of a car, shot, and his car would be stolen. But that's a separate issue. So the rule of law in this particular process is under tremendous strain. And the final point about that is that the definition of a state from ancient Greeks to the 20th, 20th and 21st century, even the famous Stalin definition of a nation, is a group of people who control their borders, have common history, have speak the same language, blah, blah, blah. If you do not control your borders, you're not a state. You're not a country. Ladies and gentlemen, European track record for the Jews in the 20th century is mixed, to say the least. It's catastrophic. But at the same time, Europe is the continent that gave us Leonardo da Vinci. It gave us uh, Burke. It gave us um, uh, music. It gave us Chopin. It gave us Beethoven. It is a wonderful culture. And for me, who was born in Eastern Europe, to see that going down the tubes through uncontrolled migration, where countries and leaders come and scream on the top of their lungs to Washington, don't do this to us. The Czechs, the Poles, the Baltic states, etc. This is, this is really a very trying and, and controversial and problematic period. So let's hope that all of us can work together to leave the world safer and more prosperous and more based on the rule of law than what my generations received after World War II. I think we see that the events are moving faster than leaderships and bureaucracies can cope with. Therefore, we at the International Market Analysis, my firm, who do political risk, who do strategic communications and public affairs, who advise corporations, are here to help. Thank you all very much. Thank you for inviting me to Jerusalem.